Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Kruger National Park. 2.2 million hectares of untrammeled African wilderness. We're sitting here at a hyena den just off to the eastern side, western side of where I'm sitting. You can hear some impala alarm calling. So we're thinking about heading off there quite soon. When we got here, there were two cubs with this, with this mother. And I'll give you a little bit of background to that while I listen to the impala alarm calling. My name is James Hendry. And in case you have wondered why you're on this website, you have stumbled across to a live game drive. Here in the wilds of Africa, everything that you're about to see is live for the next three hours. On camera today, we have Jean Drey and his um, eclectic collection of clothing and a spectacular beard. Um, on the other vehicle, we have Jamie and Viam, the picnic wildebeest. And in the final control, we have the sultry, dulcet tones of Nikki Austin, Kirsty, and Louise this morning. Stefan, Alex, and Eugene are also knocking about doing things that are very important to us. This hyena has definitely also heard the alarm calls, I think, and that's why she's moving off. So, you're most welcome. Please send us your questions, especially if you're a first-time viewer or perhaps you're a regular viewer who doesn't send questions or comments. On Twitter, hashtag Safari Live. On email, questions at wildearth.tv. Here we go. We're going to follow that hyena for a little while. Some impala alarm calling off to the west, so we're going to go and see what they're doing over there. Remember, there are more than 500 species of birds, 145 species of mammal, and over 336 species of trees to be found in the Kruger National Park, so plenty to keep us entertained here on this little section where we are called Juma. Are you ready? Good. Here we go. Not a very good start, Jean-Dre, the car won't start. So, this hyena den, uh, everybody, for those of you who perhaps are not watching and for our regular viewers, we, we know of at least three adult females who live here, um, one of whom is definitely the matriarch. We think she's got a big scar on her back. Um, another of whom is a sort of mid-ranking female with one uh, large cub and then this one who seems to be the most junior female with her two what look to me like um, young male cubs and they've gone back into the den probably to have a bit of a rest up. I think you know with these hyenas if you really want to get good action in the mornings the best time is to be here almost at first light. Just as the gear progresses slowly so we are starting uh, you can see the sun's coming up already. A week ago, it, the, the light was substantially less than it is now, and there was probably more action during the morning. We'll just get a quick shot of this hyena, and I'm just going to have another listen to see if there are any if those alarm calls are continuing. Sorry, Jean I haven't put you in a very good position. And there she goes. Still alarm calling there. So I don't know if you can hear that, but it's impala, and they make a snort which, of an alarm call. They go, pff, pff, pff. well, not quite like that, but something like that. And hyena will follow up on alarm calls often, but she's not actually doing that. She's just heading off to see what she can find to eat. I think. All right, we're going to move quite quickly now to Andre and see if we can't find what it, the source of consternation for those impala over there. They're calling directly in front of us now. Um, we've got two road options to go on. We're going to take this one here. Now, I came down into this area because I was kind of hoping, you know, there's a pack of wild dogs which we managed to see yesterday. Um, after much waiting and, and uh, gracious, gracious attempts from the other rangers in the, on the uh, neighboring reserves to let us in to have a look. They're coming from the due south of us, they're going west and north and then hunting there and then going south again and for some reason skipping this reserve, this piece of property out and I find that very strange and I'm kind of hoping that they're going to come onto the area where we are now. Okay. 
Oh, we've got lion tracks here. Big male lion tracks. There we go. Jandre, can you see them? I'll go a little bit back and then show you some. Oh, yeah. That's not good. I think I've just destroyed our brand new I have. That's really bad news. Okay. Um, right, over here. John Dre, I'm not you probably won't see it, but that's the size of the lion track we're looking at. It's quite large, about the size of my hand. It's going this way, but perhaps it's headed around that way. We're still going to continue towards where the um, impala are alarm calling. I've just broken my earpiece, brand new earpiece. Eugene is going to have my guts for garters, as they say. Uh, I will find a replacement quickly. There we go, put that in my ear, so, because the game drive is not the same without the dulcet tones of Nicky Austin. Right, this very nice one out, this very horrible manky one in, and off we go. So, the, so I know you didn't see the track because the light is just not sufficient at the moment for you to see it, uh, but a big part of my hand size. Very interesting. Paolo is still alarm calling from what I can hear. You need to move relatively quickly. So please hold on to your coffee or your drinks or whatever it is you happen to be uh, uh, sipping on. And while we follow up on these alarm calls, you'd like to know what is new with the lions. Uh, Brian, at the moment, um, not much is new, uh, but the Nkohuma pride seems to be in the far east. Uh, they've gone into Kruger, uh, that, that way, obviously, behind us, towards the rising sun. And the Birmingham males, uh, we think, are probably north in Manialeti. That's where they were last seen. And that's, that's the reserve to the north of us. But there's a big male lion track here. And that, to me, would indicate that it's perhaps one of the Matimba males, uh, which is one of the two dominant males of the area for the moment. Their time is uh, being threatened by the young, the young Turks, who are the Birmingham boys. Now the Impala were alarming around here. Stop here and we'll have a listen. This is where I thought I heard them alarm calling. These, of course, are not impala but wildebeest. They look particularly relaxed though. So we're just going to stop here and listen.
Now the Impala have stopped alarm calling now, which is a bit sad. And the wildebeest are looking very relaxed in the golden rise, risen sun, recently risen sun. Never mind, fear not. We're going to head now further south. I'm just going to see if I can follow where those lion tracks went. And hopefully find one of those big males. Goodness, I have really destroyed that deer piece. Okay, never mind, never mind. These things can all be fixed. Beautiful morning, by the way. Stunning sun, stunning wildebeest. All right, here we go. So the Impala were probably a little bit further towards there, but they were in and around this area. Good morning, wildebeest. Seen any lions? The tracks look to be from last night. There are also some hippo tracks on the road here. That's very unusual. So we'll drive around here, see what pops out. Right. Lots of zebra tracks also. Just stop up here again and have another listen. No more tracks on the road. We'll just stop here quickly. Two seconds. now calm and quiet. Alright, so let's carry on. Yeah. Certainly some impala tracks here now. I haven't seen the impala that were so upsettedly shouting this morning. Probably fractionally too late this morning. Not that you can do anything about that, of course. Lots of zebra and hippo. Right, we're going to pop across to Jamie while I speed around here and see if we can't pick up some more of those lion tracks. Um, she is in the uh, northeast trying to find some Karula tracks, who uh, is a female leopard. And so I'll hand you over to her and I'll see you in just a little while, hopefully with some good news. Good morning everybody and welcome to the Sunrise Safari and it is very chilly out this morning. I'm sitting wrapped up with my blanket and my scarf and feeling very layered up. Unfortunately no gloves for me this morning but that's what giant jerseys or jumpers are for. They can serve as a dual purpose warming up mechanism. So for those of you who don't know my name is Jamie and I have the wildebeest on camera with me who is also very wrapped up and nice and snug and warm. So, 
just a little bit of a recap of what we've been up to. So yesterday, if you missed the sunset safari, we had Karula moving through Juma. She moved up from the waterhole and she was very definitely stalking something in this area. And unfortunately, because I didn't want to interrupt her hunt, I couldn't stay with her and I couldn't follow her through the thick block as much as I would have liked and she completely disappeared on me. I don't know exactly where she went. We have a rough direction. So while you guys were with James and the hyena and then following up on those lion tracks, we've been looking for tracks of our own. And so far, I haven't seen anything crossing our northern boundary, which is a good sign because that means that she hasn't disappeared necessarily off our boundary. But we are just looping around the area and following up. I've just come into across a drainage line just to check if she crossed through there. And Scotty is also out and he's double checking for me. Now, we, when we chatted about it this morning, he came up with an interesting um, possibility for her movements. He suggested that maybe Karula will start moving towards her western boundary of her territory to go and remark and reaffirm her space there. Because Shadow has been moving into that area a lot with Sindile. And actually, the last few times that I saw them, they were right sort of on our western boundary which is apparently part of Karula's territory. So an interesting possibility, so he's checking up on our western side, I'm checking the northern side and we're just going to see what we can find. So now I want to just find a good turning around spot because I just wanted to double check that she didn't cross through the drainage line and pull a sneaky maneuver but I haven't seen anything yet so it could be that she's still somewhere in this area and the nice thing about this particular road is that it is very clear and sandy and we're out very early, so before there's any been any traffic on it. So if her tracks were coming across, we almost definitely would have seen them. if you guys heard that I'm gonna stop up ahead just to see if we can hear it again so somewhere in there there is a very upset elephant and I do know that the there was a herd in this area last night they were a little bit further to the east of us but that was a very upset elephant shouting at what probably at one of the other members of the herd just letting them know that they were in the personal in their personal space could also be that there's a bull or a male elephant following the herd and harassing them slightly but that wasn't a very happy sounding ellie but unfortunately across our boundary so we can't go following up on that just while we're sitting here, we have a question about the wild dog sighting that um, James had yesterday morning. And Chris would like to know how often we encounter or see wild dogs. Now, I've only been working here for a couple of weeks, but I do know that the Wild Earth team usually sees either the half-tail pack or the Investec pack. And they move through, I think sightings must be every couple of weeks, Wildebeest, you've been here longer every two or three weeks or maybe once a month maybe more maybe more mm. okay so what we are noticing at the moment i do know that at least one of those packs is denning on mala mala 
and the wild dogs have actually fairly regularly over the last few days been moving through Arethusa and then crossing south again in a fairly regular pattern. So interesting, I'm still getting to know the whole dynamic of the, the area, but I'm keen to hear and learn a little bit more about it. But as far as I know, there's two packs that come through and seen fairly regularly by the Wild Earth team. And it does seem that over the last few days, they are coming through more and more frequently. So the alias seem to have calmed down. I haven't heard anything. Just a very dedicated woodpecker hammering away. Okay, so now we shall continue our search for Karula's tracks. moment Scott is trying to get hold of me on the radio yeah Scott's standing by copy that thanks Scott So Scott has a very interesting update that I will pass along to James when I can get hold of him. Um, the mother of the smallest cub, so the one that we suspect is the matrix, crossing south from Sydney's dam. So really, really far away from that den. So that's, that is pretty interesting information and we'll pass that across to James. But interesting that she is so far away. My imagination is playing tricks on me. It's seeing what it wants to see and not what's actually there. mentioned to you guys about the Styx pride moving around to the east of us and Angie from Ohio would like to know if we've heard anything about the Shimungwe pride and for those of you who don't know that's a group of lions that to my knowledge has split away from the pride and has actually had quite a tough time of things it's only a couple of young sub adults and one female I think and the last time we saw them was probably about three weeks ago with Brent up near the Gari Gate 
And I'm afraid to say, Angie, that I don't have any more info on them. I haven't heard of them being called in. I'm sure that they are around, but especially with the Birmingham boys moving around in this area, they would probably have made themselves fairly scarce. So I'll let you know if I hear anything more, but at the moment, no updates on the Shumungwe Pride. Sorry guys, just bear with me for one second. Um, just confirm she's crossed north into Buffles Hook. Okay, copy. Confirm if you've got visual. Okay, copy that. I would like to respond. I'm still quite far, but maybe if you can try and keep visual for me, I'll make my way in. Copy that, thank you. Okay, guys, so Karula has been seen but completely in the opposite direction to where she was moving last night. Um, so she's way to the south of us, which is very interesting. That's not where I expected her to be. But I'm gonna try and make my way there fairly fast. The guide is telling me that she's disappearing off into quite a thick block. So he's gonna try and stay with her and I'm gonna make my way down. tracks so I've got fresh male lion tracks big males and I think that this is this these are the same tracks that James had they must have come down from Buffles hook along this road and then across to where James is. Up and down at the moment. But that would also explain why Karula is not where I expected her to be. across to Karula. Pizzazz would like to know, since we were chatting about Brent's sighting with the Shimungwes, when Brent will be back. And as far as I know, he will be back on drive sometime in the next few days. I'm not sure of the exact day. Um, sorry, just stand by for one second. I need to just chat to Scott.
that perfect thing. So I've also got in Konzo for Medora and Gala, but I think it's the same ones. They are moving south, so it must be the same ones as we've picked up on. times. moment the guide who was with her has lost visual of her but he knows roughly which direction she was heading so what I'm doing at the moment is just moving in that direction rather than going straight to where she was and then he will try and stay with her from that side of things We're not far away, we're probably about five minutes away from where we think she's going to come out. So while we race towards Karula, um, James is just taking a bit of time to really carefully follow up on those lion tracks and I'm sure the ones that I just saw are the same one and the same so quite an exciting morning lined up but that is what James is up to just in case you were wondering he's out and about tracking Sort of conjecture about whether or not Karula has cubs yet and I know that she was seen mating with Tingana a couple of months ago and Gloria would like to know if in fact she has had her cubs or if anybody's seen them and honestly Gloria I don't think she has she was seen mating only a couple of weeks ago with another mystery male up in Biffles Hook so I'm not entirely sure about that but I think she if she is pregnant it is too soon it's too early to tell but obviously the mating with Tingana wasn't successful if it was a couple of months ago because she was then mating again and female leopards as we were chatting about yesterday they do mate with several different males in the area just to try and ensure that <laughs> Is that not the best thing in the world? Sorry about that crash cut, but there was just no other option. That is the most powerful and quintessential sound of the African wild. Huge male lion and his massive, rolling, thunderous voice. And I'm not sure if you can pick it up there, but that cut straight through my chest. Okay, everybody, after that quite phenomenal sound, I'll just give you a quick update as to where we are. We are on Arethusa now, which is just east, or at least west, of Juma, where we started. This is not what those Impala were alarm calling at, uh, but it is the tracks. He is the, um, the male that was on the end of those tracks that I found early this morning. 
I don't know who he is at this stage. Uh, we'll try and find out. There was another pride in and around this area. I'm not sure who he is. So anybody who has any idea who this male lion might be, please feel free to send through your comments. Hashtag Safari Live questions at wildearth.tv. around to see his face. I just stopped here so that we could hear him call without the noise of the engine. But I'll move a little bit closer now. Hey, was that not astonishing? It came pounding through my chest. Sorry for those of you who dropped your laptops and your coffee and spilt various bits and pieces and crashed your cars. I hope you're not watching this in the car. But we, as we crash cut, but there was no other option, I'm afraid. All right, so let's get try and get a handle on who this is. first thing to notice is his nose is almost completely black which must put him at about six I'd say he's a six or seven year old male in his prime his mane is full but it's not as long as it might get on some of the older lions it's not very dark which indicates well it can be indicative of a few things but one that he's possibly not as dominant as other members of the coalition he's in. And the other is that he's got a big scar on his right back leg. And I can hear some Impala now alarm calling off to the south where he's looking, exactly where he's looking. Not in parlor, they sound like kudu. Ba, ba, ba. So, a couple of ideas perhaps ginger from the coalition of two of the Matimba males. Uh, it's possible. I don't think I've actually seen him. Before. I have seen him once before, but not live. Um, I think, I think the the two Matimba boys have got slightly fuller manes. I might be wrong. Could be one of the ones from the Birmingham Coalition, um, but I don't know where the rest would be then. I, I certainly think we'd see their tracks. But I know there were a few other male tracks in and around this area this morning. Possibly one of the Birmingham guys. Considerate of him to turn around like that. Right, he's definitely listening quite carefully to something. He might call. I hope he might call. Mm. There, he's making contact calls now. 
Fatto sta da quello che è. Pretty stiff and sore. All right, so this seems to be Ginger. He's got a nasty wound on his right left, or oh, not his right left, on his right front foot. So it is Ginger from the Matimba males. And he's just making the odd contact call, so he's trying to get hold of someone. Amazed that an, a lion that's been, had an injury that long is able to stand uh, with this distance and maintain that sort of condition. Sorry, John, but I suspect what happens is that, that he, he probably it probably loosens up as he moves, and then he's able to to carry on about his business. I've never seen a lion. What he keeps doing is reopening that wound. Just marking his territory now. Can't really see him. I'll try and get up next to him. a typical lion he's just laying down and having an arrest after that extensive walk of 25 meters and Jandre, I'm not sure yeah a little bit bumpy hold on everyone hold on to your refreshed cups of coffee It's pretty fresh, and I suspect he's reopened it again. Bye bye. Ciao. Thank you very much. Cool. Where are you off to? I'm going to start the desert. Right. Cool. See you later. Right, we have him all to ourselves now. starting to call as the air starts to warm. It was very chilly this morning, 9 degrees. 48 degrees Fahrenheit. from Johnny uh, maybe he was jumped by the Birmingham boys Johnny it's possible but I think he'd be in a lot more distress than, than um, if he had been and um, I also think that those they are a little bit further north than than this I think he you know he's quite far south and so I don't think it was the Birmingham boys I know that he's had that injury for a long time and I know that he plays with it constantly so I suspect he's probably opened it up himself you know he's in pretty good he's in pretty good nick he's uh he's very well muscled his hips aren't sticking out and he's quite lean 
but his mane is quite lustrous, although it's not dark, and I think that he's in, he's in pretty good nick. Hello Siberia Zumi, you say that when we zoom in on him his mane looks quite sticky with blood. Um, Siberia, I don't think it is blood. I'm sitting quite close in there. I th it does look quite sticky. I think there's a lot of moisture there from the um, from the grass that he's been walking through and perhaps lying on. You see it's all down the left hand side, or our left, his right. Uh, it's quite matted and wet on that side of his face, and I suspect that's from lying on the ground. I can't see any blood on him. So for those of you who perhaps are new to us, you're most welcome of course. This is one of the two dominant male lions of this area. Um, one of the two Matimba males, Matimba means strength in Shangan, and that's why they're called Matimba males. And at the moment, they are they dominate the uh, a pride called the Styx Pride you know, to the south. Uh, there are three sort of breakaways, um, although I'm not sure the breakaway is the correct term, but certainly they seem to have separated into three distinct units. Um, then there is the Inkahuma Pride which is just not far from here, and uh, on Juma mainly, and there's one more pride that they seem to look after in and around Arethusa. Now, what's interesting is that they are under severe pressure from various male coalitions, young male coalitions, one of whom is uh, the Birmingham boys, and there are five young male lions there, and they're trying their level best to come into this area and take over. Now, although there are five of them, these two males are now experienced fighters and hunters, and they'll be able to maintain for a while, but eventually I suspect those five males will probably take over. Now, looking at him, he's definitely older than, he's definitely older than six. So, some information from Georgian there, who says that he is in fact 10. Um, that's, that's pretty old. Um, yeah, he might, be, he might be as old as 10. Uh, he's definitely well older than 7 when I look at him now. Uh, his, mane, his mane is not particularly impressive for a 10-year-old, but it's not bad. I mean, it's pretty good. And apparently, she's, Georgian says that that, uh, that injury is from a snake bite. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, Georgian, did you, do, we, do we know if this snake was actually seen biting him? Um, I, I'd be interested that a snake bite has lasted that long. But it's possible. Maybe it was something like a puff adder or a night adder which nipped him there. Um, and it's just continued to fester slightly. You know, these cats will be a lot more resistant to snake venom than us. Um, so if it is a snake bite, it'll be a cytotoxic snake, like an adder, uh, which is not affecting his neurological system at all, but perhaps just creating, uh, continuing to create um, a sort of necrosis of the flesh. Although I struggle to believe that it would have lasted that long. Maybe it's just because he keeps licking it. He's a stunning fellow, isn't he? Huge head. Now, out here, 10 for a male lion is not bad going, you know. I, mean, I think the, the oldest lion on record in the Kruger, in the Sabi Sands was 16. Uh, but 10 is pretty much average for a male lion.
Hello, Brenda from Virginia. A very nice question just related to his injury. Uh, would would animals, do they know about different sort of healing properties of plants and do they know how to heal themselves when they're a little bit sick and sore? Um, for example, like when they eat grass and they're not feeling so, their stomachs aren't feeling so good, lions will eat grass. Chujan, I, it's an interesting one. I'm not convinced with lions that there's any uh, too much of that level of understanding. With elephants, I think you probably find there is. I think they're so selective, they're so knowledgeable about what they eat, they're so specific about the different things that they select. I suspect you'll find that there is an element of knowing what plants have certain healing properties and what which ones don't. I'm not convinced that lions have the same, and that's because they don't have the same experience of plants that a herbivore like, a li like, a, like an elephant will have. So I don't think mud, certainly I don't think mud would help that wound. And if it, if it is indeed a snake bite, then absolutely mud won't work. Another question from Siberia Zumi, who would like to know, have I seen a, a male lion fight over territory? Siberia, I haven't seen a male lion fight over territory for a while, but certainly way back uh, when I started at a place called Angala, I watched a couple of nasty fights and certainly heard them. I mean, the sound that emanates when two male lions fight is quite astonishing. They're not pleasant things for the lions and you don't want to be getting in the way of two big males having a fight with each other. It is quite terrifying um, and it doesn't end well normally. Normally they will, they can fight to the death, but normally one will be injured sufficiently for it to sort of run away and back off. And that's generally what happens. So I've seen it once or twice. I've heard it more than that, uh, but I haven't seen it for a long time. It is a, it truly is a, an, an awesome spectacle. <laughs> and an interesting question from Chris on Twitter. Oh, have I had any close calls with lions? Um, Chris, I'm assuming you mean on foot. Uh, the answer is no, not really. I've been very careful when I walk around lions. And you know, lions are far more likely to run away from you than they are to come towards you. And my very first lion experience was with four young males. And I was a young trainee. They handed me the rifle and said, right, you carry it, let's see how you react. And they walked me into these young male lions. And the lions, I was of course terrified at this stage, I was totally clueless, I'd just come from the city, I didn't know what was going on. The lions, the great terrifying king of the beasts, got up and ran away at high speed. The only thing I saw was a flick of a tail. So they didn't like being around us at all. And that, you know, is the general reaction of lions to people. It's not always a reaction. And some people have uh, to stand down some nasty charges. Um, but I've never had a particularly close call with lions. A couple with leopards, but not so much with lions. He's getting into a very peaceful state, it looks to me. His eyes closing. And the sun is starting to warm us all. It's a glorious morning. Crested Barbets calling. Those Franklins walked straight past him. They did notice him, looked and kind of just pressed on with their lives.
Okay, so that I'm just getting a bit of help from the final control who've just checked up on our information on the Matimba males who were first seen apparently in 2011. There were six of them. It's not unusual for them to fragment like this. Um, I wonder where the others have gone. And apparently the oldest one then in 2011 was six. So that would put these guys sitting at around 10 if, if he is the oldest. I must, I must say, my, my initial impression of him was that he's younger than 10, but he could be 10. So some more great information from Georgian in Illinois, who says that the snake bite information came from a ranger in the Manileti where they were first seen and apparently it does heal and then he opens it again or it opens again. Um, it's a very interesting wound actually. I mean I can't, yeah, there's something funny with it. I suspect he plays quite a large part in keeping it open. It probably bugs him and just itches a bit and so he keeps it open. He looks very at peace now from the slightly agitated calling that he was doing a bit earlier. Um, Dr. Debbie, you want to know basically if he got into another fight, would another lion sort of notice the injury and then try to exploit it? Well, you know, these animals do notice weakness. There's no question that they like to go for the weaker um, animals in, a, say, a herd or, you know, when they're preying on animals. So if he was obviously limping, I suspect absolutely he would be, um, be a more attractive uh, attractive target for young for young male lions coming into the area so if he was obviously limping I think they'll definitely notice condition so if he looks like he's unhealthy and sick um, then they will probably go for him oh here we go give us a call come on boy come on I'm sure, look, I don't know what kind of speakers you're all listening to this through, but I hope they're good ones. That rattled my rib cage. Hey, eh, Jean-André? <laughs> Jean-André is nodding with a grin on his face. It really does, it does rattle the ribs, and it's just a, a you can't speak when they're calling like that. It's the most amazing sound. It fills the entire atmosphere. It echoes down through the drainage lines, through the leaves, and you could see the magnificent sort of um, uh, condensation coming out of his mouth as he yelled. And I think he lay down like that, not because he was tired, but because it allows him to move his neck in parallel with his body. So it's probably easier lying down like that or standing up. And now he's listening for a response. It's quite late for him to be calling. 
Oh, it was just the most, it's the most incredible primal sound. If ever there was an argument for in investing in some spectacular speakers, that's it. Just for the chance to hear that. And it truly does fill the entire area. And now all we can hear can hear the woodpeckers, the starlings in the distance, the old robin. Interesting debate. Um, well, first of all, Astralina reckons that uh, he's a magnificent lion and better looking than his darker main brother. His brother certainly has a more grizzled look about him, but I think that's probably got to do with the fact that his testosterone levels are probably a bit higher, and that's why he's got a darker mane. He's probably a bit more dominant than this fellow. Anyway, um, and then a nice question from Kevin How long do I think a lion like this will live? Well, Kevin, I'm going to say that I think this lion is not quite ten. I'm going to stick my neck out at the risk of being pilloried on Twitter. Um, I don't think he's quite ten yet. He looks too in too good a condition to be a ten-year-old to me. Uh, it's, he's probably up maybe nine. Um, Kevin, ten is not a is a pretty average age for a male lion in this particular area. Um, he might live, uh, like I say, the oldest lion in the Sabi Sands ever recorded was about 16 or 17, and that was down on Sparta, uh, near Londolozi. And I think that with the pressures that are being exerted by the Birmingham lions, I think he'll be lucky to reach 12. It's not impossible that he'll reach 12. Um, I don't know where the rest of the coalition went. If there were six of them to start with, and there are only two left now, um, I don't know where the rest of them are, but these guys need to stick together. If they want to f ward off the threat of five young males, they're going to need to st stick together. Initially, two big dominant males will fairly easily dispatch five young males who are inexperienced and don't know what they're doing. But after a while, that pressure will start to tell, and those males will take over. Um, so mm, I think you'll be lucky to hit 12. But I might be wrong. Tula and Ellen um, just about talking about the call and why he's calling. Um, did it seem distressed? No. Now remember that a distressed lion 
will normally be distressed by the threat of other lions or other predators in the area. And so if he was distressed, he wouldn't call. He'd try and hide. That's their big form of defense. It would, he's now attracting attention to himself. He's advertising. That's a territorial call. He's saying, this is my land. This is my place. He's probably trying to contact his brother, the other Matimba male, if he is indeed his brother. They do look quite different, so they might not be brothers, but certainly the other coalition member. He's probably telling the females in the area that he's around. So that big, obvious, brooding call is, is a huge advertisement for him. So he's not feeling in the least bit threatened at the moment. If he was feeling threatened, he wouldn't call. If he was felt like he was in danger, he'd hide somewhere. That's basically what happens. So he's inviting, he's basically inviting conflict by saying, here I am, if you want me, come and get me. Just like most animals out here, so for example, people say to me, or have asked me before, when there's a leopard walking along calling, they want to know, is he hunting, is he hunting? Um, and the question is obviously, no, he's not hunting. He would be sh why would he be shouting at whatever he's trying to catch? Uh, likewise, likewise, a lion like this, if he's feeling threatened, um, well, he might be feeling threatened to the extent that he's saying, well, come on, guys, come and get me. Here I am. This is my area. But he's not feeling threatened enough to be distressed. If he was distressed and worried, he'd be disappearing into the drainage lines. He'd be hiding under a thicket, and he certainly wouldn't be making a noise like that. He's inviting conflict like that. If the five Birmingham males have decided that they really want to take over the area now, um, he's inviting them to come. So he's saying basically, yeah, you want it, you come get it. Here I am. And ironically enough, the, one of the closest roads is Ingwe Alley, which is named because of the frequency of leopard sightings that's on it. So Ingwe means leopard. I think that other game drive vehicle is going for a different approach. Not entirely sure where he went. He might be trying to get around down to the other side of the drainage line. So it is great to see her eating and Kay and I are in agreement that she was looking a little bit thin and hungry yesterday afternoon when we saw her and when we did see her yesterday she was stalking through the bushes. So definitely Kay, I agree with you, it is fantastic to see that she has eaten and she's got a meal because she was looking hungry when I saw her yesterday. She, that flap of skin that they have around the back legs was starting to show quite clearly. So she was definitely in need of a good meal. And she's probably spent the hours between when we saw her stalking and now just trying to hunt and find an opportunity and an opening to get some food. So fantastic news that she has managed. And I'm really, really happy to see it. And it's also great to see that that injury on her leg and on her neck hasn't in any way impeded her hunting abilities. I can actually hear her crunching.
I would very much like to reposition myself at some point. However, uh, it's going to take a lot of bumping around and some experimenting before I do that. So I might wait a little bit while we do have a good opening for her. So a little bit earlier, we saw that fish eagle that VM spotted fly past and he did a fantastic job of keeping up with it. And it had a fish in its claws. And we have a question from Morrison asking, what, how does a fish eagle land um, when it has a fish in its claws like that? And I have seen them land before with the fish. They kind of shifted more into one foot and then they come into land and they keep the fish sort of between their foot and the branch and use one foot for extra stability and the other foot for really keeping a grip on the fish. So that's generally how I've seen them do it. <clears throat> it isn't always the most graceful of landings though. It can be quite fun to watch. So guys, I would like to find a nice way in. And before I reposition, and I will be sending you back to James while I do work my way around. However, before I do that, there was just one quick question from Jan about whether or not anybody knows for sure how Karula was injured, and we don't. Um, she, it was picked up on by guides a couple of, about a week ago, or maybe just over a week ago. They saw her crossing into Juma, and they noticed the injury. And my suspicion, just looking at the wound, is that it was caused during a hunt. Possibly if she tried to tackle something and it kicked her. It doesn't look to me like it was caused in a, in a physical contact between another leopard. So I don't think she had a fight with another leopard. It is always a possibility and there's no certainties, but that's just my personal opinion. And it's not uncommon for these cats to get injured because obviously the prey animals do fight back. And it is unlikely that she would have been fighting with a male So it is, that's a possibility. The other possibility is that it was caused if hyenas tried to come and take her kill from her, something like a hyena coming in, especially if she's down on the ground like she is now, they might have come in and tried to get it. But that also is fairly unlikely because a leopard will be fairly quick on her feet and will choose to dash to safety in 99% of the cases. She'll dash to safety and not try and defend her kill. So the hyenas probably didn't inflict that. I think it was something that she got while she was hunting. However, I want to get us a nice view of her, or at least try to. So I'm going to see if I can. I'm just going to maneuver around and experiment. In the meantime, I'm going to send you back to James with the lions. I know that I did interrupt him. So I will be back with you, hopefully with a really nice view of Karula. Hello everybody, while I am quite jealous that you've been looking at Queen Karula and her breakfast, we've been sitting here with a beautiful male lion. He hasn't called again, so you haven't missed anything here, but he's just basking now in the beautiful warming light of this perfect winter's African day. We had a question just before you left me um, from David in Michigan. Um, David, you wanted to know basically a few things around the calling, why he's not moving towards whatever he might be calling at um, or calling repeatedly. David, 
normally what they do is they call exactly like he did. First of all, it's quite late for him to be calling. So they normally do it at dawn or during the night. And they call like that. And then maybe half an hour later they call again, which is precisely what he did. Um, and what that does, though, remember, he's calling to advertise territory. So he's not, he's not doing it to attract or to, to try and find something else. He's basically saying, this is where I am. And uh, so stay away if you happen to be another lion. And he, he definitely was listening out to see if his brother called or to see if someone else called. Uh, no, no one did. And so he's just calmed himself down. He'll probably go to sleep now. Now, when the females and prides are around, and I've heard males call, and I've heard seen males looking for them and failing to find them, the females often do not call back, especially if they're on a kill. They know he'll come and monopolize any kind of food source, and so they often won't call back. And I know that the tracks of the pride that we were following earlier, they haven't been found yet, um, but they are in and around this area somewhere, I don't think anyone's following up, so when we leave him, we'll probably see if we can go and find them. Um, and I think that is the Styx Pride that the, that the guys said were on just south of Juma yesterday. You can see that injury there now. So David, just to summarize quickly, they call like that as an advertisement for territory. Yes, to make contact sometimes, but if they know vaguely where the other animals are, they'll walk towards them and make a soft ho, oh, oh, ho, oh, ho contact call rather than that great big territorial roar that he made. Very nice uh, comment from Linda, who apparently left her computer on. And when the drive began and this great male lion started to call, she had to leap out of bed, rush towards her computer and turning it down and turn it down for fear of being evicted. Linda, I'm so glad that you still find yourself with a home and somewhere to watch uh, the wonderful safaris that we're able to bring you from. <laughs> from the, the depths of the Kruger National Park here in South Africa. <laughs> I'm most pleased you don't find yourself out on the street homeless. Um, and then another question about the roaring and what its effect on potential prey items. Um, it'll do two things. The roaring will certainly uh, make animals more aware of where the lion is so if they're in the immediate vicinity they might back off a bit but of course once a prey species like an impala or a zebra or a wildebeest or a buffalo knows where the lion is they it's it's good for them because then they can keep an eye and keep an ear on exactly his movements and so they don't need to watch their backs too much they know exactly where he is now that's why it just links into what I was saying earlier about how um, when animals are roaring like this, they're definitely not on the hunt. They're roaring in order to advertise territory, and the pre I think the prey get a sense of that. You know, you don't start hearing alarm calling from all around when a lion roars like that. It's because they know he's not on the hunt. Yes, of course, he takes something if it stepped across his nose, uh, but in this kind of light, if he's roaring like that, I don't think it'll have a huge amount of... Uh, it won't make a huge difference to the prey that's hiding around here. Ah, very nice question from Sarah in New York. Sarah, excellent. Uh, you want to know, basically, can they identify each other from a call? Sarah, they can, you know. Um, apparently, if you take, they've done experiments where they record a certain lion, 
take it into a different area and they record males and females and different kinds and absolutely the lions are able to distinguish if they hear a strange lion being played back over a set of high, high quality speakers they'll come rushing in to try and defend the territory against the intruders and likewise if they hear lions that they know they will generally just uh, ignore them uh, ignore the calls and carry on with whatever they're doing so absolutely very nice question there Sarah thanks Velma, you want to know when the last time when was the last time the two Matimba males were seen together? Well, Velma, we've just had a ranger in here from Chitwa Chitwa, which is just to the south of Juma, and he says that he saw them both together yesterday with the Sticks Pride. So that would make sense uh, for the the tracks that we saw this morning. Sticks Pride heading in here and somewhere around here, and this male obviously was with them. I wonder why he stopped. I mean, it's not unusual for the males and females to separate. Um, but it's not that usual for the two males to separate. It might be that that injury started to bug him again. And that's why he, he stopped moving. I'm not sure. But they were seen yesterday. So not long ago. Question from football expert, how many prides do the Matimbas have? I like that question because it indicates a great understanding of lion social structures. So the prides, for those of you who don't know, a pride is does not include the male. Foot, as football expert has realized um, or knows, um, a pride is the females and their cubs. And these males, the Matimba, as far as I know, they dominate the... Uh, the um, the Kahuma Pride, which spends most of its time, or a lot of its time, on Juma, a little bit to the east and a little bit to the north. And then they dominate the Styx Pride as well, which is just to the south of Juma most of the time, but sometimes they come on around the Twin Dams and Treehouse Dam areas, and then they come into Arethusa here as well. I think they may have some involvement with the Pride further west of here, but I think it's mainly those two Prides. And that would be about the right size for a, a coalition of two lions like this. The other thing was quite interesting that the, the other ranger came in here and he said he told his guests that that fight, that injury had come from a fight. Um, and I, I, didn't, I don't particularly buy that argument, I'm not really sure. So there's obviously quite a lot of conjecture as to how he got that injury. Something to think about. We're going to go across to Jamie now, but something to think about. An injury that's lasted a year like that would indicate that whatever it is, whatever the source of that swelling and that um, uh, sort of bleeding and fairly infected area is, is probably still in there. Now, in the case of a snake bite, or in the case of an inj of, of a say a claw mark or something like that, I suspect it would have healed by now or spread and hurt him quite badly. I think this is my guess that there's a thorn in that foot and that it hasn't come out, and I suspect that's why the swelling maintains around that localized area. I don't think it's causing infection in the rest of the body, but it's definitely localized in that one area, and I think it's perhaps a thorn that he's got in there and it won't come out. Anyway, we're going to go across to Jamie, who's repositioned with the magnificent Queen of Juma, and I'll see you a little bit later. So guys, welcome back. I hope that you enjoyed your time with that Matimba male. And as you can see, we've shifted around a little bit to get a better view of Karula. We are perched on a veritable precipice right now. Um, I've got my handbrake all the way up and the gears holding us in place. 
but we have managed to maneuver ourselves into a good position to have a look at her. And I know that you were chatting with a little bit about that Matimba male's foot, so we've got two slightly injured animals at the moment, but nothing too serious. But before I forget, I do have an update for you guys that I've caught over the Game Drive channel. And I know a lot of you are curious about the lion movements, so I just want to talk about that quickly before I forget. The Styx Pride were seen following that huge herd of buffalo that moved through on Torchwood. So they are around. Um, I'm surprised they're up that far because I know that the Unkuhumas moved through that area. But by the sound of it, the Styx Pride are around and they're doing what we were talking about with those big herds of buffalo just following behind and looking for a nice opportunity to snatch a kill. So that is where the Styx lions are at the moment, as far as I know. Um, that was the update I was given. So they are around. And isn't it absolutely wonderful to sit with this incredibly beautiful girl and her Steenbok kill? And you can see she's absolutely ravenous. She has not stopped eating since we arrived. She was very, very hungry. And she's probably going to be finished this kill fairly quickly. She obviously was very hungry. And it's great that she's mm, hair in the mouth. <laughs> Not pleasant for her, she just wanted to get rid of that. So she decided that she'd prefer to be more comfortable tucked away there. But you can see how quickly she's moved through that kill. That was almost a whole kill then. So the update from the Styx Pride, they are not on Juma. They are further east in Torchwood, as far as I understand, which is why I was quite surprised to hear that it was the Styx Pride. And it's something that I caught the tail end of a conversation. But interesting that the lions have done as we predicted they would and started following those buffalo herds. It's very tempting to go out and just <laughs> hop out and remove that particular spiky bush that's in our way. So as I mentioned before, Scott was the one who actually went walking around and found Karula. And Miss Jin would like to know if he found, if anybody was walking with him or if he was alone when he was tracking. And he was alone, he was just wandering through, following up on the reports from another guide that had seen Karula a little bit earlier move into this block. And that particular guide decided he was going to leave, he'd had his sighting. So Scott went in afterwards and just went walking through this drainage line. And I think what actually led him to her was the call of a couple of grey go away birds that he followed. And then he spotted her just a little bit to the west of us. So fantastic work from him and we're very grateful. And I know I'm getting some updates, especially from Ellen, to say that Karula is a fantastic little hunter. She's very quick, very cool, very quiet and very successful. So it's awesome to see that particular um, aspect of her personality in action. I did notice yesterday she was went from walking sort of casually through the bush to hunt mode very, very quickly. So it's great to have you all on the back with us. 
are sending through your questions and I'm so glad that we've got to share this update with you and nice to see that from yesterday's hunting to this morning's successful kill she is proving to be as efficient as always. I'm meant to be looking for the pattern of spots that sort of spells out wow on her head. I think that was something that Georgian sent through to me yesterday afternoon and I didn't really get a chance to double check so I'm trying to have a look now. Unfortunately she's not exactly clear at the moment. Apparently she has an identifying spot pattern that spells out wow on her, I think it's on her forehead, her forehead, um, I'm sure you guys will know. Mm, and the go away birds shouting again. There you can see that injury that I was talking about on the back right leg. I'm just trying to see, I'm going to grab my binoculars and just try and have a closer look. It doesn't look too serious. I mean, it looks uncomfortable, but not. So it looks to be healing over quite nicely. There's a lot of, it looks clean and healthy. There doesn't appear to be any infection. And I think that will heal up soon. And those gray go away birds are shouting at something. I don't actually think it's her. They're a bit further away. Could be another bird of prey. Those of you might have heard about our cool sighting yesterday where an, a goshawk chased a Franklin underneath the deck right in front of us while we were having lunch and a cup of tea. It was very, very exciting. And the poor Franklin had a very lucky escape and I imagine stayed under that deck for a considerable period of time, recovering. So it could be that the go away birds are shouting at a, a bird of prey because there are raptors that will target birds. You can hear that awesome scraping sound. And that's just her. It's just her scraping across, her, across the bones with those amazing molar teeth that form that scissor-like pairing just to strip that meat from the bone. So thank you guys. It's great that you've confirmed for me and from Sherry and Christy have both told me that it was correct and it is the spot pattern across her forehead. Now she has chosen this particular moment to tuck her head behind 
a series of bushes and dead grass but when I do have a chance to look for that I will so thank you much, very very much for that info I really appreciate it and that was Sherry and Kirsty you can see how easy it would be to miss a leopard if you weren't paying attention and you didn't stop to listen for the sounds of the bush at the moment her crunching might give her away she is making a considerable amount of noise while she's chewing through this carcass and I think it is just she is incredibly hungry and leopards generally will be quite selective they won't necessarily eat too many bones but they might ingest the odd small end or something along those lines one of the tiny bones will be swallowed and sometimes you do see leopard scat that has turned a little bit whitish in color from the calcium but very very uncommon most of the time they will avoid the bones and they're also quite picky about how much hair they eat so she will pluck we did see her a little bit earlier on just plucking out bits of the hair before she started to feed on this kill and you saw that expression on her face a little bit earlier when she was trying to get the hair out of her mouth how distasteful she found the whole thing so she's been highly entertaining to watch So the next few hours will play out a couple of different scenarios and what will happen next in terms of her time spent with this kill. And Chris, the answer to that is it depends on whether or not she gets spotted and that is a little bit of luck involved in that. Hyenas could come through, they might they do have that incredible sense of smell, so they could pick up on it and potentially come down and have a look. I doubt it though. I don't think that they are going to find her before she's finished up what's left of this. Um, the first, often the first animals to be on the scene, either during a leopard kill when a leopard is feeding or once it's abandoned it, some of the first bird, the first to arrive are the birds. So the raptors like battaliers and tawny eagles, they tend to fly quite low to the ground, much, much lower than vultures and they move sort of underneath some of the tree line and they've got incredibly good eyesight so it means that they can spot these kills fairly quickly and move in and they will definitely be among the first to scavenge from it and then you've also got animals the some of the smaller scavengers something like a jackal a black-backed or a side-striped jackal that could come in and grab it <clears throat> but again it just very much depends on what is in the area right now and what is moving through this area a bit later i think that with this particular kill it is small and she is hungry i think she'll have finished it but by the time anything comes to potentially threaten her but what we did see the other week which was really really interesting was tingana made a very large kill he killed a kudu and he tucked it into a drainage line and when steph went back to look for him the next morning he discovered that the Styx lion pride had actually kicked the leopard off the kill. So although it's very common to see it with hyenas and leopards, it is less common to see lions coming in and taking over a leopard kill. Just because usually there's, especially for the females, they tend to target these smaller antelope and so there's not much left of it. But in this particular case, because the prey item was so large, the lions decided it was worthwhile and you have to feel a little bit sorry for Tegado who managed to take down a massive kudu and then almost immediately lost it to the lions. 
Although I think he did have at least some opportunity to feed from it. Something's caught her attention. She's suddenly very alert. And it always pays to be very vigilant, but whatever it was, it wasn't too serious, so she's gone back to feeding. You can hear that serious crunching sound as she's breaking through into the carcass. And Jim would like to know whether or not leopards will eat the bone marrow. Hi Jim, welcome to the Sunrise Safari. I hope you are enjoying this particular view as much as I am. And to the best of my knowledge, they generally won't. They do, their teeth are not adapted for really crushing into the thicker bones where there is good bone marrow. So the leg bones mainly, the sort of the upper part of the femur or the humerus, they need to really be able to crush and break in there. And that is more the department of the hyenas. But maybe for a small kill like this, they would be able to break apart some of those larger bones and get into the bone marrow. So never say never, but it would be fairly unusual. And it typically isn't there approach to feeding that is more the role of the hyenas that are adapted with that incredible jaw strength and teeth structure So I know that there's lots of interest about where exactly Karula is and Siberia would like to know what my general area is. Siberia is one of our zoomies and would like to know if I'm close or in and around the Buffels Hook area. And there's also a question about what the closest road is to her current location. And we're not in the Buffels Hook area, we are further south we are further south from the juma dam probably about a kilometer or two and the closest road we're basically in between two we're in between ingwe alley and pangolin i think it's pangolin road or pangolin way i'm still i've got the roads now but i'm not exactly sure of their precise names but that is roughly where we are we are tucked away in this drainage line that runs between two roads and very interesting that she has headed off in a completely different direction to what I was expecting her to do. So last night when I left her, she was north of the Juma Dam and she was mobile north. She was definitely moving very straight up towards the Buffels Hook cut line, which is why I started my search there this morning. And, but I mean, of course, as the wind shifts and change direction and as she attempts to move through the night and hunt and fails, she will have to keep moving to different areas to try and get a successful hunt. So obviously that's what happened. There's also always a chance that there was another leopard calling that either moved her in this direction or moved her away from a certain direction. And I did see fresh, fresh hyena tracks. Oh, the other thing that might have shifted her, now that I think about it, was those huge lion tracks that we saw on the road, basically where I saw her last night. So those Matimba males definitely moved through the area. They came south that way. And I think those are the ones, or at least that, at least one of them is with James at the moment. But I think they moved through that area and there's a chance that she just decided, nope, I'm moving out of here and I'm going to stay away from these lions. So it could be why she's here at the moment. But I hope that gives you guys a bit of a, an update on where exactly we are. The grey go away bird still shouting in a sort of offhand manner. Still not at her, I don't think. Although they might have spotted her. They definitely had earlier.
so she is sitting now with quite a full belly. But I think she's at least halfway through that Steenborg. Probably a little bit more by now. And she has been eating almost from start to finish without stopping since we've seen her. So I think she's going to be finished this kill probably in the next hour or two. Unless she stops for a break at some point. But I think she's almost through it already. And there will not be much left by this afternoon. She'll prob we'll probably find that if we do return to this area for the sunset safari, she will have moved off. Just because she's not going to hang around a kill that's finished. Because its smell will attract other predators. And she doesn't need that kind of interference in her life. So once she's finished with this, she will probably head out. Which is exactly what Shadow and Sindile did with their Steenborg kill a couple of days ago. And so far the two leopard kills that I've seen have been Steenborg, which makes sense because both of the leopard sightings I've had with kills have been females. And typically the females will target the much smaller prey items and they are at they can be up to 30 or 40 kilograms lighter than some of the biggest males. So she is a tiny female. And although she's a very efficient hunter, she won't be tackling the large kills like kudus. And probably would be staying well away from warthog as well. Never say never, but generally that is the domain of the really large male leopards. <coughs> so in Vula and Tengana, they will be the ones that target the bigger animals. And yesterday there was a report that Shadow, Sindile and Tingana were sharing an impala kill to the south of our boundary. Oh, up she gets. And I think she might be done. So my predictions about when she was going to finish that carcass. She's pretty much through it already. She might be. This is where she was a little bit earlier with the kill when she first started feeding. So she might be looking for any remaining scraps. But there we can see she's got a nice full belly now. Much, much better than when we saw her yesterday afternoon. When she does move across and into this block, there is no way that I can drive forwards to find her. So there is a good chance that she could vanish. I'm just having a post-meal wash. I'm going to struggle to stay with her because I'm going to have to extract myself from this precarious position that I'm in first. Always important to keep yourself clean after a meal. And very common to see predators and cats lick their paws before they get moving. Oh, no, she sat down. That's a good sign. I think she's just going to have a nice wash. And there she's giving us a good demonstration. I know there were lots of questions about how leopards groom themselves. And she's showing us perfectly. So licking her legs and her feet and then using it to wipe her face. And just get the remnants of the kill away from her fur.
beautifully done. I can see that small injury on her neck also doesn't look too serious. This is the first time I've been able to have a good look at it. Um, but it doesn't look too serious at all. And there you can see those amazing whiskers of hers catching the sun. And those are such incredible extensions of her sensory perception and a great way to move around through this thick, thick vegetation um, in the, on the blackest and darkest nights. Just a way of picking up when there's anything too close to the face and that might threaten something like an eye. So an integral part of her. She is clearly very meticulous about cleaning up after her meal. And this morning light is certainly very flattering. Ah, oh, there I saw the wow on the forehead and off she goes. She is going to disappear off into this bush and unfortunately I'm not going to be able to follow her that way around. Okay guys, so um, we're going to try and stay with her. It is going to be very, very tricky, but I am going to try and get out of this particular situation. So, but before we do, she's just finished off an entire steenbok in front of us. And Chris would like to know, when you have a small meal like that, when will she hunt again? And she could potentially even hunt again tonight or tomorrow because she will digest that very rapidly and leopards are opportunistic and she didn't look completely full. So it could be in the next day or so, but at least she has had enough to sustain her. All right, I'm going to try and extract myself. It is going to be a little bit loud. We did come crashing through several bushes to get here. an opening and I'm going to try and take it. Unfortunately what I have learned from my exercise yesterday in trying to relocate Karula, she is very very sneaky and stealthy which is great for her but it does mean that finding her again is going to be tricky. She doesn't necessarily pick one consistent direction. But yeah. So guys, while I fight my way through the bush and try and find out where she's gone, I'm gonna send you back to James and I will be back with you a bit later, hopefully still with Karula. Welcome back to Jika. Um, sorry that you've been away from us from so long. Um, the signal has been very dodgy and you've been with the magnificent queen of Juma, Kurula, the peaceful one. Um, now, we have come away from the Matimba male, um, not because he did anything untoward, uh, but because there were tracks of the rest of the pride coming in here earlier today, uh, we think the Styx pride, 
Um, I, we've had some reports of Styx Pride following um, buffalo elsewhere, far east of here. It's possible that um, you know there seem to be two or three different kinds of Styx Prides. I'm still slightly confused as to how it all works, but that's fairly typical. Lion Prides do split up from time to time. They will come back together again and they'll split up again. But we had tracks of at least two females and probably a cub or two um, in and around this area this morning when you were with us. And I just came away from here. They thought they were probably, the Arethusa guys thought they were probably in this block around here. It's a big block, but I haven't managed to find any tracks going into it. So we're just going to keep going around the block and see if we don't find any tracks. And if we do, we'll follow up on them. And if we don't, we'll go back to the male and see what he's doing. I suspect not a great deal. That said, it is a cold day, um, it hasn't warmed up substantially yet, and so he might move a bit and he might call again. Um, you know, it's difficult to tell exactly what's going on. Those tracks that we saw this morning, though, were pretty fresh, probably from early, early this morning, say 4 o'clock-ish. That's an estimate, but I'd say that's probably around about when they were knocking about when we first found them on Juma. So, on we go. Send through your questions if you want them. I'm more than happy to talk to you while I'm driving. Hashtag Safari Live questions at wildearth.tv. And if you are a new viewer or a viewer who watches us and is um, fingers paused over the keyboard and thinking about asking a question or making a comment but then stopping yourself because you feel a little shy, please don't feel shy. Fire away. We love to hear from you. I'm on my way. Question from Jemps in Johannesburg, who clearly doesn't have quite enough to do at work at the moment. Uh, welcome, Jemps. Um, you want to know, is there a way to identify different lions? Jemps, uh, from their facial patterns, there is actually, uh, but you have to have a very good photo photographer, a very good camera, and you have to have quite a lot of time. Um, if you look at the whisker patterns above and next to the nose, Jemps, you can, in fact, find the different... Uh, you can see that there are different whisker spot patterns. But, you, you, you know, there's sort of 10 or 12 on each side. And so a quick identifier, like with the leopards, is obviously very difficult. Uh, but it is possible. It can be done. Um, much easier, though, to identify them from the color of their manes or the thickness of the mane or any scarring there might be on the face. Thank you very much for that question, Gems. Uh, from Johannesburg. I suspect somewhere around Empire Road, if I'm not mistaken. So, tracks are supposed to be heading in... Ooh, what's that? John Ray, do you mind sticking your head over the side there? like some hyena tracks from an expert tracker slash cameraman Jean Dre on the back. Yeah. Yeah, they look like they're, they're, they're definitely not lions. So this block is quite large, uh, which and a block, for those of you who perhaps don't know, um, is an area of uh, bush surrounded by roads in which there are no roads. And so, this particular one is quite large, and so I don't want to just go blasting in there to try and find these lines if I'm not very sure that they haven't crossed in. And I'm not entirely convinced at this stage. I haven't seen any tracks. And, you know, with a leopard, it's quite easy to miss the tracks going into a block like this. But with a pride of four or five lions, unless there's been a huge amount of activity, we shouldn't miss them going in here. We've almost circumnavigated the whole block. And 
has anybody had any thoughts on whether the it might be a thorn? Anybody with a perhaps veterinary or medical background, um, what do you think of the the postulation that it might be a thorn in the Matimba male's foot? Edward, an interesting question. Um, basically, you want to know if Harry Belly, who's the other Matima male with a big dark mane, the big black mane lion, um, if he got taken out by, say, the Birmingham Pride, you don't think that the uh, ginger, who's the other one we've just seen, would be still around where he is? Um, uh, Edward, I would say that's absolutely correct. Um, if ginger knew about it, certainly he'd probably have been part of the fight and he'd probably be slinking away into the night quite carefully on his own. Um, he wouldn't be advertising like that. But, you know, that roaring we saw early this morning is very typical dominant behavior. He's advertising his presence, he's telling everybody that he's around. Um, so I don't think that there's anything untoward happened to him or his brother. Remember the last two? What is that? That's a leopard track. <laughs> Deborah in Ontario. We're just still on the topic of roaring lions. Sorry, I'm just going to slowly answer your question while I'm looking at the road, if you don't mind, Deborah. Um, there is a leopard track, female leopard track there. See that, Jean Pay? Unless it's a young male, it could be Cindely. No, you won't see it on the on the camera, everybody. Um, all right. So, Deborah, you want to know if there was a threat? I don't think it's very fresh. This leopard track. Um, if there was a threat for posed to young, um, to the Matimba male there, would he roar and call his brother? Um, he'd certainly make a noise. Whether that would attract, and it would probably attract his brother. And certainly if there was any sense of distress, it would attract his brother too. So, yes, quite possibly uh, he would call. Um, I just don't know, you know, we do tend to anthropomorphize things quite a lot here, and I don't mind it at all. But when we say, um, would he call his brother, would he be actually shouting for him to come and help him? Uh, I don't know, you know, I don't know if that's how their minds work. Quite possibly. So we are in and around Shadow's territory and she um, she apparently is in and around Safari Lodge at the moment. So this fever, which we, uh, we're not far from Arethusa. So this could well be Shadow's tracks that, uh, that I'm seeing. But no lion tracks going into this block here. So I'm not sure where the information came from that the lions had gone in there. And I am watching the road with great care. So 
as we've discussed in the last little while, the line dynamics are going to be very interesting coming going forward. Um, with the two, two males, two big Matimba males, and those four Birminghams, and a number of other males pushing from different sides, and quite nicely centered on Juma, which is our core sort of area. Um, so hopefully in the next few months we'll have a bit of action. Although it all, everybody tends to start rooting for different lions, and it can be, um, it can be a traumatic time. Uh, just hippo walking in and out, the odd civet, but there ain't no lions. Thank you, Kay, on Twitter for the suggestion uh, for uh, old Ginger and his, the thorn in his foot. He was suggesting um, I, I take him down to where I was trying to catch a catfish the other day in one of the pans and uh, see if that doesn't help draw the thorn out of his foot. Well, Kay, I'll, try, I'll ask him about it next time I see him, which will hopefully be later this morning. Whether he will acquiesce or not, I'm not sure. Yes, Jean-Dre, we are... ...going in here. I think we've been sent on a wild goose chase. Sans any gooses. See, here's where the male joins. Yeah, I think we're going to go, everybody, I think we're going to go back to that in the timber male and ask him where he thinks the rest of the pride is. Ah, nice question. So there's a common misconception that a male lion is an incompetent hunter. Now, Please excuse my not looking at the camera. I'm not being rude. I'm just trying to keep an eye out on the road for tracks. And Chris wants to know how good are young male lions at hunting compared with females? Chris, they're actually very good at hunting. The young males that go off take a little while to learn, but they're extremely competent, especially if they're in a coalition, and they do some exceptional hunting. So they're just as competent as the females. They're a bit bigger, I suppose. So. They're possibly a little bit more lumbering and not quite as nimble, but they definitely are able to, to take down some fairly substantial prey on their own. And, I mean, they have to do that for a few years. So Junior, who's the male in the Inkahuma Pride, who's now he's three, three and a bit years old, um, male lions have normally been tossed out by that age. And he hasn't been tossed out. And... You know, so normally between the ages of say three years old and six when they take a pride, those three years they have to, they spend hunting quite extensively and I think you'll find that they're actually very good hunters. Especially before they get that big heavy mane, which probably does make it a little bit more difficult for them. Now, there are no lion tracks going into this block. We're going to turn around here and go back towards the Matimba male and see what he's doing. Kind of hoping he hasn't moved off. I doubt he has. Just going to go a little bit further to where we... Yeah, there's the track, John Doe. Yeah. Unless these lions are flying, or well, I've gone blind, and given that I had jean to double check me, I don't think that's the case. They're not in this block here. So let's go back and see what the male's doing. It's getting a little bit warmer, but it's not a, I mean, it's definitely not a hot day. There's still that sort of chilly wind from the remnants of the cold front that came through yesterday. And so he may have moved, but it's quite sunny, and I suspect he's just lying in the sun. In fact, it's got so sunny that 
Jean Dre has removed the woolly cap from his, uh, I mean, he's got quite an impressive head of hair. I mean, compared with mine, it's, uh, he looks uh, it's, it's almost Afro-ish. Uh, and he's now put on his sun hat. So Rena, just back along the lines of whether these lions would, uh, you know, sort of how closely knit is their team. If they felt threatened, would they stick together? Absolutely they would. They definitely find safety in numbers. I wouldn't be surprised to find that um, the other male is moving with the pride at the moment. Um, certainly there were tracks with the pride. And I wouldn't be surprised to find that the injury on this one is just making him irritated with walk, keeping up with the pride the whole time. And I suspect maybe that's why he's, he's on his own there. Uh, I don't think it's hampering him too much, but you know, the males don't necessarily like to hang around the prides unless there's something in the offing to eat. And so I suspect you'll find that that's what's happened. But they will absolutely, uh, if they feel threatened, they'll definitely hang around together. But remember, they won't wait for each other. They're not, we, as human beings, we are, we're very attracted by the thought of um, egalitarian behavior, that the sort of egalitarian society that a wild dog uh, or wolf pack has, where they help, they tend to the sick, they feed the sick, they feed the weak, they wait for the stragglers to catch up with the rest of the pack or the rest of the pride. Remember, lions are completely unlike that. They're not going to wait around. So if if um, this ginger lion has a se severe injury in his foot, uh, his brother is not going to hang around for it. So they will try and stay together if there's a threat, but it's every man for himself in the lion society. And same with the, with the lionesses and the cubs. If the cub can't keep up, keep up with a pride, it'll be left alone to die. For me, there's very little more um, succinctly savage and primal or um, indicative of the sort of savagery of the wild, if you like, than lions and their behavior towards each other and their general kind of um, survive at all costs attitude to sort of their individual living. probably find that the document some of the wildlife documentary films that have been made um, you know the, there's some brilliant ones out there there's some really fantastic ones but you know some of them are often not that biologically correct and they will they like to tell a good story and so there'll be the odd indication of a one male waiting for another or one female trying to protect her cubs uh, at all costs but they just they just don't do that right so we're heading back towards the matimba interesting question from football expert who wants to know how many years the Matimbas have been dominating here in the Sabi Sands. Now first of all football expert they don't dominate the whole Sabi Sands they dominate a fairly small portion of it. Uh, well not a fairly about a third. Call it a third and um, there are other coalitions further west and further to the south that dominate there and I think they've been in and around the area for about three years which is normally the kind of tenure that a coalition of two will have before they start to get threatened again. So I think three, three and a bit years is round about how long they've been in and about here. Certainly Junior, who's three, just over three years, is their offspring. So maybe almost four years.
keeping an eye out for tracks. I don't think that the pride will be too close to this male because he was calling the whole of the morning and listening quite carefully for any sort of sign of response. And if they were just with the, um, the females, I suspect they wouldn't have answered him. The male may have answered the other Matimba, but maybe not. answer Edward's question because it's quite observant. Uh, Edward, you are an observant human being. Um, John Red, do you mind just uh, panning sort of probably to, our, to my right? Edward has noticed the amount of greenery in this area and made the comment, Does, is there a bit more water around here? Yeah, Edward, there is, you know, we're in a sort of, um, it's, there is a drainage line, but there's also a kind of, mm, it's almost like a catchment where a couple of drainage lines look like they start and so yes there are lots of quarry bushes around here and that's a big scotia tree that on the top right hand side of your screen that's just disappearing out of frame there that's a, a weeping boar bean on a termite mound i think there is quite a lot of water being sort of seeping through this area and down into some of the more some of the larger drainage lines so yes and the elephants will there's definitely evidence of quite a lot of elephant activity coming through this area but remember anything else anything that's green at the moment this time of year you can be almost sure is inedible uh, we've watched lots of elephants around right now over the last few days and they go through uh, these areas and it's funny how they specifically do not select the green stuff because the green stuff that's still left tends to have very powerful chemical compounds in it that they don't like to eat tannins and various other toxins. All right, nice one Edward. I didn't even think about that until you mentioned it. So I'm just looking around here. It does look like it's sort of a catchment area where a number of different drainage lines are starting. Joyce in Missouri, who it, I tell you, it never ceases to amaze me how the amount of information that um, our wonderful viewers have uh, and where they get it from is also amazing. But Joyce says that the rest of the Matimba Coalition, which started off, I think, at um, six or seven, um, is in the Manileti and they're called the Northern Coalition. And up there, the, the two Matimbas are known down here as the Southern Coalition. And that's very typical. So those Birmingham boys who are now five, when they take a territory, the chances are that that coalition will, will split up. I think you'll also find that's why they're between Manialeti and here. They're probably looking around to see what the best option is for a territory to take. And you may find that three of them dominate up there later and two down here or, you know, vice versa. But I don't think they'll stay together as five. It would be fairly unusual, although it certainly has happened. Thank you for that, Joyce, in Missouri. Joyce, I do hope one day that you'll be able to come out here and actually see these lines about whom you so, know so much and have dedicated so much time to. So another very interesting question from Dr. Debbie here. Dr. Debbie, you want to know basically what will happen when the males start to mate. So if those Birmingham males came into this area and they started to mate with the females, would only one or two of them, or one, or how would it work? Normally what happens is that if, if the coalition is uh, um, brothers, there's no actual dominance amongst the coalition. 
And what tends to happen is that when one starts to mate, if so a female comes into estrus, she will normally then, there's the male, let's just get it, just see if you can spot him there. Can you see him, jean -Dre? Just see if you can have a look at him there, through the bushes. Same fellow. Just while we look at him there, it's just a, I love to do this when we come up to lion sightings because that's what you've got to look out for when you're on foot, of course. Keep your eyes wide open. And when I first saw him, his head was up, then he put his head down again and he becomes almost invisible in the grass. So we'll go a little bit closer now. Dr. Debbie, your question, basically what happens is a female will come into estrus and one of the males will mate with her uh, until that sort of mating cycle has finished. Uh, they normally don't share. And let me just pull in here. And then if another female comes into estrus, another male might mate with her. And he will complete that sort of mating cycle. That tends to be what happens. I'm sure there are exceptions. I mean, I'm sure there are times when the males uh, on the other side. I think he's going to probably put his head down that way. Um, I'm sure there are exceptions where sharing does occur sometimes, maybe, or where one of the males is perhaps bigger than the others, and so he has more mating opportunities. And I think that's happened in this pride, in this coalition. I don't think these two males are brothers. I think they've formed a coalition um, of... Is this fine, John? I'm going to go forward. Happy to go forward? Yeah, closer. And I'm just going to get him the grass. Right. He's eating some grass now. There we go. He's still, thankfully sticking his head up and looking around, magnificent boy that he is. So I don't think that these males are necessarily brothers at all. They look very different from each other. And I think there is a hierarchy amongst these two. Uh, they say that um, the darkness of a male lion's mane has quite a lot to do with his dominance and quite a lot to do with the testosterone that there is in his body. Good grief, a lion standing up at nine o'clock in the morning. Oh, no, that, that foot is bugging him. There's no question it's bugging him. And he's obviously also got a little bit of digestive trouble. A bit of an issue in the bowels that he's trying to sort out by eating some fibre to help whatever blockage there is in there come out. Hopefully, while we're not around. Hello, Paula in Virginia. Do I think that Junior is being kept around by these Matimbas to help with um, the Birmingham Coalition of Five? Paula, I would say no. I don't think that's the case. Um, Look, nothing out here is impossible, and the greatest fool you can make of yourself is to say, well, of course, something like that never happens. Two fathers, or two, a father and an uncle would never keep a junior male in the area in order to help with a, a, you know, a marauding coalition coming in from another area. I might be wrong. I don't think so. I think it's highly unlikely. The more typical behavior would be for them to chase him out because he he wouldn't junior wouldn't see these two as uh, uh, you know as a supportive coalition at all he'd be more likely to join up with the birminghams but paula nothing is impossible out here and so many of the textbooks you know textbooks that you read were written by scientists who come out and they spend six months with lions or maybe a year with lions and a year with leopards or that sort of thing. 
but because of the amount of time that we as guides get to spend out here with them we are constantly seeing new things and new forms of behavior that are just don't occur in any of the books and i think very very much like with human behavior um, you know if, if you were an alien and you landed on mars or you came from mars and or a Martian friend of yours had written a book on human behavior. Can you imagine how many misconceptions there'd be if somebody tried to write a treatise of typical human behavior uh, in a couple of pages or even in a hundred pages? Can you imagine how many mistakes there'd be and how many exceptions to the different rules that they're trying to impose on human behavior there'd be? I think it's exactly the same with a lot of the ethology or animal behavior uh, that goes on in the wild. So it's not nice to see an animal with an injury like this, but unfortunately the policy is that we don't interfere. And um, especially if it, you know, he's not losing condition. Hello, Grant from Sydney, who's missing the bush. I'm assuming that means, Grant, that you have emigrated from our shores, and I'm sorry about that. At least Sydney is a beautiful city to be in. Grant, uh, you want to know, would Junior basically join them at uh, Birmingham Boys? And for those who perhaps just joined us, the Birmingham Boys are a group of five young male lions who are looking to sort of take a territory now. Well, this fairly ridiculous old fellow tries to chew on a tree and some grass um, and Junior is a three and a half year old male who <laughs> yeah sorry I, Grant I'm going to get back to your question just look at his look carefully if he opens his mouth again this is not a ten year old lion he's got big sharp teeth His teeth are much too sharp for a 10-year-old. Anyway, Grant, um, so you basically want to know about the size of a coalition, how big, how big can they get and what's the biggest I've seen. Um, I know of a coalition of six that has come into this area. I know of a coalition of nine that has been in and around the Manileti. Remember, those coalitions are, are very unlikely to last at that size. Um, so they will definitely split up Grant. Uh, so, but at six, not entirely unusual um, in this area, especially while they're trying to take a territory, and then they will probably split up. And if they take a territory, say six of them take a territory, that will probably constitute four or five prides, and then they'll tend to kind of focus on one or two of the rest, or one or two of those prides. You know, so they'll split up three will be in the northern section of the, you know, one section, and the rest will be in the other. Ooh. But what is interesting... Okay. We're gonna, we're gonna nip across to Jamie. I seem to have got ourselves slightly stuck. I hope it's not a permanent arrangement in front of this line. But we're gonna go across to Jamie, get a, an update on Karula, the Queen of Juma, and I'll see you just now. So guys, 
welcome back. I hope that you've been enjoying your time with James and the ginger matimba male. So just a quick update. Unfortunately, Karula kept moving in a very, very thick part of the block. So we did try and follow and we had one very brief visual. The Inyala went absolutely insane. She bumped a little herd of Inyala in there and they started barking very, very sharp barks. Bah, bah, bah. And the squirrels also started shouting. Unfortunately, it was very, very thick. As you can see, we have acquired a passenger as a part of our Bundu bashing experience. So we've got many sticks and leaves attached to the car and some thorns in both myself and probably in the wildebeest as well. So unfortunately, we have lost her for now. She's tucked away. We think she might have gone flat in that thick section, so we couldn't get another visual. So I just wanted to keep you guys updated. And on the subject of updating you, I have been on the radio because it seemed very strange to me that the Styx Pride were up in Torchwood following the buffalo herd. And I think that they were just misidentified at the time. It is the Unkahuma Pride up in Torchwood following along behind the buffalo. So we'll keep an ear out for any updates on that situation. Um, possibly if that buffalo herd crosses back into Juma, then maybe we might get to see the Unkuhumas a bit later. But I just wanted to let you know what was happening and give James a chance to reposition. So we've been sitting with this herd of Duggar boys. They're not up to much. They're just enjoying their time here. So I'm going to hit the road and see what else I can find for you for the last few minutes of the sunrise safari. And for now, I'll send you back to James and his lion. And here we are at a beautiful grass sighting uh, with a lion in the background. I really love this time of year for the colours. They're much more subtle than in the uh, sort of verdant green of the summer. And I love the gold and the reds and the subtle orange this time of the year. He's been most accommodating by sitting up and looking at us and showing his magnificent face. Christy and football expert just asking some questions about why he's eating grass and what he's eating. Um, he is not eating tree leaves. He's eating. Um, he's, he's eating. He's eating grass, and they do that to help with digestion. They also do. They don't. Uh, football expert, you, you're thinking maybe he's trying to eat some some leaves off a tree to help uh, medicinally with his foot. Um, no, I don't believe that's what he's doing. He is eating grass. I haven't seen him eating any leaves. There was some long grass around the trees where he was just now, and that's what he was going for. So yes, just like all carnivores, they will eat grass every so often just to line the stomach with a bit of fiber and help pass through a couple of the nasties that get stuck in their carnivore uh, short carnivore digestive systems. Remember they eat a lot of hair and bone and hooves and um, s things that you and I probably wouldn't eat and to, in order to push them through the intestinal tract they do need to line the tract every so often with a bit of grass and fiber. And so that will just help it along its way and like I say you don't want to be here when it eventually does emerge because the power of the stink coming off a lion's dung is something from the bowels of hell itself. Little breeze coming up, rustling through the quarry leaves. And the guari leaves are the only bits of green that you can see around here. There are one or two combretums and some tambuatis with a few leaves, but mainly it's guari leaves. And there's just a hint 
on this breeze, although it's at the head of a cold front, there's just a hint of warmth in it and a hint and change of directional change makes it feel like it's coming from the northwest, which tends to be a herald of the end of winter. Um, an interesting, two interesting questions from Jan in Singapore, or Jan in Singapore, and Pretty Nightmare. Basically, you want to know, would we intervene medically uh, for any reason? Um, I think, Jan, you want to know about, basically, with this damaged foot, would we intervene? Uh, no, we wouldn't. Uh, it's a perfectly natural thing for it to have happened, unless there was an anthropomorphic thing for it to have happened, unless there was an anthropomorphic cause to it, so a snare or something like that we'd leave it be and let nature take its course. That's because lions, and this leads on to Pretty Nightmare's question, um, it leads on to the, uh, it's because lions are not endangered in this particular area. They are near threatened, uh, certainly. But in this area, if we were to help him out, it might give him another mm, six months or so. Uh, but eventually this coalition is going to fall by the wayside, like all coalitions will um, by, uh, fall by the wayside. He's also, we're also not sure exactly how it's affecting him. You look at him, his coat is shiny, his mane is standing up, um, his muscle definition is still good. He's not fat, but that probably just means that he hasn't eaten for the last little while, uh, and his hip, but his hip bones aren't sticking out, and that's an indicator of, of poor health. I think he's in pretty decent health, you know, and he's had that injury for over a year, and yet he's still managed to survive like this. So we don't really know that a medical intervention of any kind to pull that thorn out or fix that snake bite or whatever it is, we don't know what effect that would have on his life and whether it would actually make a difference. But certainly with an endangered species, if we came across a wild dog, for example, that was injured, or a cheetah that was injured, we'd absolutely call the vet in and the vet would come and dart the animal, try and fix it up. If it was really bad, they may remove it and take it to a rehabilitation center, uh, but most likely they'd make some kind of obvious intervention in this area and, and then sort of give them an antidote to the dart and let them carry on their way. So medical intervention is kept to a minimum unless, as Pretty Nightmare suggests, there is an endangered species. So let's just have a quick recap of the morning. We don't have long left and we're going to hand you over to Jamie to say a final goodbye just now. Um, so we followed the tracks of this pride, or no, a pride, probably the Styx pride, onto Arethusa this morning. There were two males, looked like two males with them, and those pri that pride has not been found. We then did come across this magnificent male lion, and he called beautifully for us this morning twice, and it sent a, an amazing shiver through our spines. Jandre was uh, Jandre is nodding vigorously now, and our, our rib cage is really kind of rattled as he called. This amazing uh, throaty roar that permeated the vegetation through here and must have traveled, I'm sure, to the other lions within. Mm, I'd say up to six or seven kilometers away from where he is now. And then we tried to find the rest of the pride. We haven't found any of the rest of the tracks. So on the way home, I'm probably going to just see if we can't find some other tracks. And he's remained here. 
very um, kindly sitting up and showing us his magnificent face all the time and it's been a real privilege to spend some time with him. You have been magnificent, all of you, with the questions and comments. Thank you so much. You've kept the discussion lively and good. And so I thank you for that. And thank you to jean -Ray for his excellent expert um, tracking and work on the camera. And we will see you later this afternoon. We're going to go across to Jamie now and have a great day or morning or evening, wherever you happen to be. So guys, welcome back to my particular vehicle, which is Jigga this morning. And what a fantastic sunrise safari it has been. So from James's amazing Matimba male calling for all of you guys to our sighting with Karula. So from yesterday afternoon, following her, seeing her attempting to hunt and now to see her with a successful kill. Unfortunately, we didn't get to see her again but we did go back and have a look and she'd eaten absolutely all of that steenbok everything including the bones all that was left were little pieces of the jaw so she is a well-fed leopard and she is now once again on the move and hopefully we can catch up with her for the sun sunset safari this afternoon so as always a thank you to the wildebeest for his wonderful camera work and for providing us with those great shots Thank you to all of the viewers and to Nikki and Lou in FC. And we will see you guys all this afternoon for the Sunset Safari. I hope you're looking forward to it as much as I am.